Hello, welcome to my talk. Thanks, to com thanks for coming. Uh, welcome to my talk, Balkanize, Learn to okay. Earn. So let's start with some universal truths that we can hopefully all agree on. Um, number one, some countries are poorer than others, and uh, frankly, some countries are probably just poor. Uh, often we call them uh, developing countries. Uh, number two. Uh, although markets have been doing not that great lately, I think some of you might still have made some money. Number three, some people, or if we're being honest, actually most people, especially in these developing countries, they're lacking awareness of this whole uh, web-free space. But at the same time, we need more web-free literacy, and we actually need more web-free developers. So now let me actually introduce myself. Hello, GM. Buenos dias. Um, this is me. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Dennis or Denis Vuchkot. I was born in 1988 in former Yugoslavia. Today's Bosnia. I moved to Germany in '92 uh, at the beginning of the war. Lived there most of my life, and then. Uh, 2014, I actually moved to Switzerland for a PhD. I studied industrial engineering, had like a focus on energy economics, worked a bit, and then uh, did this PhD uh, at ETH uh, Zurich uh, with a focus on machine learning. ETH Zurich is like the technical university in Switzerland. It's not affiliated with Ethereum or the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, I then worked as a data scientist. Last stop was um, at eBay. Uh, left uh, that position at the end of last year. And um, yeah, I'm now with this little project that goes under the name enot.io. And I'm also a partner at very early ventures, like an early stage venture fund. Um, I've been involved in this crypto space for a few years now. This is my second DEF CON. First one was in Prague. Um, I did this weird thing in 2018 where we built like a Bitcoin client in Python from scratch. And I'm a quite regular user of Dune Analytics for all sorts of like uh, on-chain data analytics. These things together with my background will become somewhat relevant to the actual uh, design or architecture of the program. Okay, now let's dive into some local truths. Um, Bosnia, the place that I'm from, it's probably safe to say uh, that it was hardest hit during uh, the wars in the 90s. It's still ethnically uh, quite divided. Uh, youth unemployment rates are quite high. I think uh, until recently the numbers were around like 60, 65 percent. They claim they're lower now. Uh, if the numbers are true, then I think it's mostly because people are emigrating to the West. And at the same time, the GDP per capita is around 5K US dollars, like 400 uh, USD per month. Would, that would translate into 400 USD per month average salary, uh, which is not that much. Interestingly, if you look at it on a like, purchasing power parity basis, it's a factor of 3x higher. That basically just means that uh, life there is quite cheap. Uh, students there usually have a strong theoretical basis. They often lack opportunities for practical experience. And when they uh, get practical experience, they often end up choosing like a weird tech stack or um, some outdated technologies. That's kind of a little bit of my opinion, though. OK, now let's look into some hopefully generalizable solutions. Uh, I am of the opinion that with guidance, uh, incentives, and arbitraging this purchasing power parity, uh, you can achieve quite a big impact, both for these people, but also for our whole industry. What does that mean? Guiding, basically um, telling people what they need to learn and how they acquire these skills, then incentivizing 
by mapping this learning, this is the learn to earn component, mapping the learning to some monthly income, and then the purchasing power parity <laughs> arbitrage, which basically means funneling money from a place where a beer costs seven euros to a place where a beer is one euro. Doesn't mean the people have to spend it on beer, but it's just uh, my personal Big Mac index. Um, and I think through that you can achieve quite, quite high uh, leverage, good type of leverage. So that's the theory. What does it look like in practice? I currently have eight students in this first batch in Bosnia and Serbia. They're aged 20 to 25 uh, years. They have a background in computer science or physics, either final year students or graduates. They receive 150 euros, or US dollar, uh, per month per student. They're supposed to learn like a machine learning track, blockchain training as well. The learning is outsourced. I'm not doing that myself. I think I'm lacking uh, the patience for that. But the projects uh, are in-house. I'm making sure that they learned what they were supposed to learn. The expected duration is like 9 to 12 months. Currently, uh, they're about to enter the third month. For more information, you can see inart.io slash scholarship uh, with a few funny pictures. And only quickly, let's look into uh, the curriculum or the timeline. What are the students actually learning? I mentioned they usually have a um, computer science background. They did some Java, maybe some JavaScript, some front-end development. They're then transitioning to Python mastering the libraries that are essential for data science and machine learning, NumPy, Pandas. Then, first level, we're actually doing machine learning. And because every data scientist or machine learning engineer ends up spending quite a lot of time with SQL, uh, I make them use Dune Analytics um, to actually work with real-world data, which is quite uh, useful for me as well, because I don't have to uh, yeah, host any fake data. And then eventually in the next uh, modules or levels, the students will be interacting with a web free Python library. I'll make them do what I had to do, like re-implement uh, Bitcoin from scratch uh, in Python. And then eventually we'll be going into smart contract development. Um, okay, um, what's next? Kovadis. Well, uh, a minor point, it would be nice if we got like some more crypto-native remittance. Currently, it's still Revolut transfer-wise, uh, but there's just no local economy for the students to, to do anything with USDC, AFR, or whatever. Big question is, what is this becoming? Will this be an education Ponzi, or will there be like income-sharing agreements at some point to, to fund next generations? All open questions. Uh, but the most important thing, and that's kind of why I'm here, is to spread the word and uh, make people that are interested or in a similar position uh, copy pasta, uh, not just code, but uh, maybe even uh, this type of setup uh, where you can guide and incentivize and support people in other places and hopefully push them into uh, yeah, this web free space. Big vision. It's written here, it's years, decades, centuries, maybe away, who knows, maybe not. Um, yeah, that's it, thank you. A really good talk. I, you. I would like to ask you how, or yeah, how do you think you can incentivize investors into getting into the DAO to have more scholarships? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I I'm, my deliberate choice was initially to just do it myself, don't do any outside funding. Next steps might be to talk with some of the organizations that are here, I don't know, Giveth or Talent Protocol. I've already spoken with a few of them. Uh, maybe that's like the leanest or easiest way. Uh, I guess any investor funded approach, yeah, might be related to just investing in, in, in talent that eventually would work for you. Uh, Germany, Switzerland, uh, they both have like this apprenticeship culture, which essentially is like uh, uh, you, you got uh, young people and you're um, paying them to, to, to become actually productive uh, workers. So I could imagine something like this working. Now this would be very tied to a company. If we get this income sharing thing, I mean, I like to think about these ideas. 
but I think that's still uh, philosophical conversations, but yeah.